Welcome to the video lecture series, Culture, Worldview, and Origins. We're Tim and Holly Nyquist. This is the second lecture in the series of the origin of dinosaurs. It has come across a number of people's minds is that dinosaurs, um, is it are they just a product of, of myth, of mythologies, or did they really exist? Or how about dragons? Or how about how much is mixed with uh, um, what might have been true and might have existed, and, and that which is just imagine imagination or mythology? That's what we're going to look at in in this series. Um, digging into it, we're going to dig into what about dinosaurs and try to answer some of those questions. Um, they were personal questions, so that's why the digging was was uh, was not just academic, but it was. Uh, because of, of interest that, that I had. And uh, that interest was spurred by, uh, I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, the origin and mystery of the dinosaurs. Did dinosaurs really exist? Well, this is what we're gonna look at. Fossil evidence. What's the fossil evidence say? Well, there's two types of fossil ex evidence, well probably more, but there's direct and indirect. So the direct fossil evidence comes from the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, I had the privilege of, of visiting the, the museum there. And uh, he, there they have encased this huge theropod foot. It's a T-Rex. It's a and I don't remember the exact dimensions, but I think the case was like four foot long. So um, that, is, uh, that would qualify as Bigfoot. But uh, so dinosaurs existed. Well, by the remains that we have, direct remains, we would say yes. What exactly did they look like? That's another question. It's really hard to reconstruct exactly what they looked like for various reasons. But there's another source of, uh, of fossil evidence, and that's the indirect fossil evidence. And that's what we have on this side, which are um, dinosaur tracks but they aren't uh, theropod, they're called sauropod tracks, which would be like a dino, uh, like a uh, elephant, a trunk, uh, just a, a stump kind of walking up the hill. And this is in Toro Toro, uh, Bolivia. And uh, this is why the interest is because uh, Bolivia has a lot of uh, dinosaur tracks. And so we've spent uh, a number of years just uh, tracking those tracks down and actually making replicas of them. So that is, um, did dinosaurs exist? Yes, they did. Here, they're, they're just passing through. There's, there's the indirect that's called the trace fossil, uh, that they, there was a trace of them left. And then this one here is, yes, that, uh, that is one of them. That is at least the foot of one. And uh, it appears to be a, been a very big one. So did dinosaurs exist? Yes, yes, they did. And as to when, though, and as to what happened, um, that is what's subject to discussion. Two, they were not always known as dinosaurs. So you can't punch into Google and look up dinosaurs and to know that that's the full extension of information about dinosaurs. And it's kind of like, well, why is that? Well, it's because the term dinosaur um, in 1825 didn't exist yet even. So it was uh, in 1825 that Dr. Mantell found a huge tooth that resembled a much smaller tooth that, was familiar, that he was familiar with. He was familiar with the small tooth of an iguana, but this big tooth resembled the small tooth. And so then he said and called this big tooth an iguana don, an iguana don. So that was the the beginning of naming of a new of a new discovery of a new type of species of iguana don, which means it was big, something that represented something smaller, but um, it was something about it that was of the same same structure, but its proportions were 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 really different. Over time. More and more bones and teeth were being unearthed, yet they had no name for such a creature. Though the bones were similar to the type of a lizard, the size proportions were incredible. The name Megalosaurus was given to them. 
mega big losaurus lizard. So it's just a huge lizard. That's what they were calling these bones and teeth. And uh, that was from 1825 up through the 1830s. Well, then in 1849, Sir Richard Owen, a British paleontologist and zoologist, came, with the name, came up with the name Dinosauria, which means terrible lizard, which stuck as the official name of the animal that those huge bones pertain to. So in 1849, 1849 is the beginning of the dinosaur age. Um, actually, at least by name, dinosaur. So that was 1849. So what are dinosaurs? Well, dinosaurs are a, a, a group of reptiles and it's the configuration of their hips and how they walked. So technically dinosaurs were, were basically uh, land-dwelling animals. Um, there are other animals that existed at the same time that were very strange, um, that flew or that swam but technically they, they would not be dinosaurs because of their, their locomotion and their, their hip design. So uh, dinosaurs are a group of reptiles that first appeared about, okay, 245 million years ago. Now the non-Westerner would say, okay, that doesn't really compute. Uh, they dominated the planet until an extinction event wiped out a large swath of life on Earth about 66 million years ago. This is from the American Museum of Natural History. So, dinosaurs. They existed, saying, 245 million years ago. Then there was an extinction event. Now, the non-Westerner would say, event? Okay, what was that? What was that like? And uh, so that's what would call the attention, not, not the abstract numbers or, or, or even the, the thoughts about it. So what was that? Well, this is an article from uh, Live Science on competing theories about that extinction event and what it looked like and what happened. And so the competing theories are the asteroid impact theory was controversial when first posited in 1980 by physicist Luis Walter Alvarez, who said that such an impact could explain an unusual abundance of iridium associated with the geological boundary of the KT extinction. KT is the boundary line be between the Crustaceous and the Tertiary, so they just call it the KT extinction. And what called their attention to this boundary line? It was an element, a rare element. It was called iridium. And iridium then, they said, is in, in more higher concentration in the sedimentary layer that has enveloped the dinosaurs or where they find dinosaurs. And so iridium had something to do with the extinction of the dinosaurs. Where does iridium come from? Well, that's a good question. This guy says it was the asteroid that impact because iridium comes from asteroids and from outer space. So iridium is the, is the, is the element and the asteroid is the carrier that is being given responsibility for the extinction of the dinosaurs. But there's another leading theory. The other leading potential culprit, the colossal volcanic eruptions. Okay, why is that? Because iridium has two sources. Iridium is found deep in the Earth's mantle and is released through volcanic eruptions or it is contained in asteroids and comets that come in from outer space. So there are two sources of iridium and that's why it, uh, we, we have to understand what the evidences are and how they're being interpreted as to what it was and why do they believe it was that way and it's going to be the glasses that color for different reasons. Okay, so the uh, volcanic eruptions that they say occurred between 63 million and 67 million years ago. The huge volcanic eruptions created the Deccan Traps uh, lava beds in India. So what they're saying is that uh, iridium has two sources. Uh, there's competing theories. 
And the two theories are competing for the two sources, one being asteroids and the other being volcanic. So that is why and how the two theories are in competition. But the basic line is iridium. Iridium is the, the rare element that, that's associated in higher concentrations around the dinosaurs. Back to what we're starting with, Stephen Jay Gould. First, facts do not come to us as objective items. The extinction of the dinosaurs. We have some evidences, but those evidences are going to be interpreted in different ways by different reasonable people. Why? Well, first, facts do not come to us as objective items seen in the same unambiguous way by all reasonable people. Theory, habit, prejudice, and culture all influence the facts we choose to observe and the way in which we perceive them. That's been our, our manta that we've been trying to pound on is that um, science is not ob totally objective because science involves scientists. Scientists are human and we are saying that the human factor must be included in the process. It is not totally unbiased and uh, uh, objective. Uh, it includes the biases of humanity that is involved in the process. So that is why Stephen Jay Gould's quote is up here that, again, influence the facts we choose to observe. The main element in the extinction of the dinosaurs is iridium. And so we're looking for sources of iridium and that would be the cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. But there's another fact that's rarely observed and that's where do we find iridium and where do we find the dinosaurs because they're together. They're in sedimentary rock which means sediment, which means laid by water, which means um, the number one cause was water. It had to do with water. And that, that water created the fossil beds and created the conditions somehow to fossilize, which then included the iridium. So it's kind of like we choose to observe that not a lot is said about the fact that the dinosaur beds, one, to find dinosaur bones or any of the bones, it's usually in sedimentary rock, which was laid by water. Another one is that interesting, if you want to do a little research, uh, look up dinosaur cemeteries or dinosaur graveyards. And it's kind of like, Dinosaurs did not have the practice of burying their, their, their loved ones. But yet there are cemeteries or graveyards of just quantities of animals that have been deposited, buried, and fossilized in, in places that are very remote. So it's kind of like, okay, it's what we choose to observe what we choose to and so we're focusing on the asteroids we're vo focusing on the volcanoes but those two actually were not the cause of the extinction um, directly now they may have been a trigger but the extinction and fossilization process had to do with water these are some articles like i said just for a an exercise if you want to have some if you have internet and uh, you like to just google things around uh, look up fossil graveyards look up fossil cemeteries and how common they are and uh, just know that animals did not live that way and so it's not that they were buried in their natural habitat either then um, they were swept off and swept along and buried uh, in a in a great quantity First, the dinosaurs. This is an article that says the dinosaurs may have been part of a mass die-off resulting from a monster storm, comparable to today's hurricanes, which struck what was then a coastal area. 
The findings could help solve a mystery concerning why the badlands of western Canada are so rich in, in dinosaur fossils. So here now is a scientist that is talking about the actual conditions. He's not talking about asteroids or, or volcanoes. He's talking about where we find the dinosaurs, where we find them. And, and they are been a part of a massive die-off, but they were, he recognizes they were buried. And they were buried in, by a marine environment from a monster storm. Okay, going back again, a monster storm, if, if you have an open system, a monster storm that a non-Westerner thinking um, that's from a biblical parameter, they would say this is a flood. This is the flood. So if that your system is open and you do have the possibility of having a flood, then a non-Westerner would say, it wasn't an asteroid or, or a volcano that, that killed him. It was, it was a flood. Here's another article. Archaeologists from Germany and Mexico have unearthed what they believe is the largest dinosaur cemetery in the world, in the Mexican state of Coahuila. While the area where the fossils were discovered looks like an inhospitable wasteland, again, at the moment, 70 million years ago, the desert landscape was actually a fertile piece of land. There was a huge delta here and several rivers flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, why does he say there was several rivers here and it was a gulf? Again, to preserve a cemetery of dinosaurs, it's, it needs sedimentary um, movement. It needs water. So again, this is, uh, we go from Canada, inhospitable, uh, arid zone, that there's a huge cemeteries. We go to Mexico, and there's huge cemeteries and, and water environment. Well, now we move on to another one. A fossil site has captured the moments just after the asteroid hit. Okay, well, we're, we're now including the asteroid, but it's now giving more focus from the asteroid to what happened after it hit, or if there was a hit. After the asteroid thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs collided with the earth, paleontologists have claimed. The remains of fish and trees unearthed at a graveyard site called Tanis in North Dakota provide evidence for a series of deadly events that played out in the immediate aftermath of the impact. Within minutes, the scientists think, earthquakes and sea surges swept sea creatures inland and burying and preserving their bodies in sediment. That's probably a more reasonable explanation of what happened, how the fossil record was formed. Not just, I mean, an asteroid, not just a volcano, it was water. It was water that created the, the, the conditions to, to fossilize and to create the sedimentary rock. Last one. The find was discovered in September last year in San Juan province, about 1,100 kilometers west of Buenos Aires. The site is between one and two meters in diameter, one to two meters in diameter, and about the same in depth. So it's a, a box that's about the, that's the size of the site that's been excavated. Leading scientists to speculate. It was a former drinking hole at the time of a drought, and the creatures died of weakness at the spot. Okay, so the, the hypothesis is somehow they were buried in a drinking hole that was two meters by two meters or, or somewhere about there. What was buried? Well, these are uh, eight or nine uh, dinosaur type creatures that were the size of, of oxen and they're found in this hole and they're just all mixed together. And so what is the interpretation of it? Well, how do you interpret it? Well, that includes your, your ground zero and your reliable source of knowledge 
and your basic beliefs, how to interpret. So how is it interpreted? Well, most scientists don't believe in cataclysms. They don't believe in cataclysmic events generally, and they stay away from floods and from what would be interpreted as, as Noah's flood. So here we have leading scientists to speculate it was a former drinking hole at the time of a great drought, and the creatures died of weakness at the spot. So probably then what? Reaching over to get a drink of water, they fell in. And then one after another till eight of them were all mixed together. Could be. What that does is just brings us to understanding that did, did dinosaurs exist? Yes, they existed. How do we know? It's from direct evidence. Direct evidence is the, the fossils, the fossilization of the, the bones, the structures of, of somehow. But then there's indirect evidence too, and that's the, the trackways that have been left, the, the, the footprints. And um, that is, so we, we do know, yes, they did exist. And the, the framework of time, Kairos, is concentrating on the event. Then when were they, or what were they, and what happened to them? That is their more uh, focus, whereas the Kronos would focus on how many years ago, 246 million years ago, and when did they die out, 66 million years ago? That really means not much to a the non-Western thinking that is in not in abstract thinking of, of time so stretched out they can't even conceive of it. So, but if the dinosaurs did exist, why don't they today? How do we know they did? It's because of the evidence, the fossil evidence. Well, then how was the fossil evidence, how did we find it? What was it? Well, there is iridium with the fossil evidence, okay, with the dinosaur. So that means that it has, there's higher concentrations of iridium with, the, with that boundary. So what does iridium have to do with it? Well, iridium is in higher concentrations in the Earth's mantle or in asteroids. So the cause of the death of the dinosaurs has to do with either one of those two. There are those that speculate, well, the, it was probably volcanic because if there was an asteroid impact, there should be really high concentrations of iridium in the impact sites, and that's not what is found. So the other vol volcanisms, uh, they say, then we believe it was volcano. It was because that is dispersed. So that does fit in with if we go back to the fossil record of the previous lecture series that what were the mechanisms of the flood all the fountains of the deep broke forth which many believe studying that that it was volcanic that initiated the flood series and then with the volcanic eruptions of lava and maybe iridium and ash, volcanic ash, going up into the atmosphere, and the ash being the, the, the particles that could promote condensation, which would then fall back to the earth um, of an ash that would be wet, that would be moisture, that would come down as raining, um, could have rained as kind of a lime substance and accumulated the lime um, caps that are uh, layers that are uh, on 75 percent of the Earth's crust now. So there are different ways of interpreting things, but just as Stephen Jay Gould said, the facts we choose to observe and the way that we perceive them. There are facts out there, and sometimes we it doesn't fit our model, so we don't choose to observe them. We just let them go and we choose to focus on something else. And so what this is saying is that we choose to focus on the fact that there's iridium in the, ca in the, in the Earth's crust in a higher concentration where they find dinosaur bones, but they find all the bones and the iridium surrounded and in sedimentary layer rock. So I would go with the sedimentary rock and understand that what else was involved as mechanisms.
We're Tim and Holly Nyquist, and uh, again, you can communicate with us through those through the information that's on the, the, the screen here at uh, doubleroadrover.com or thn.academia uh, at gmail.com.